And welcome back, folks. It is Monday, the 25th of March, 2024. Good to see you all back with us once again. Here's Chris live in central Pennsylvania giving your daily injection, jab, protection against disinformation, misinformation, which comes mostly from the media and the government and fake news. Yes, got a little bit of fake news to report on today coming from New York Slimes. Gonna expose their fraud once again and talk about how misleading journalists, so-called journalists can be. But welcome back to the program. Lots of election news in South Africa. Pardon if my face is a little bit red. I spent a fair amount of time in the sun yesterday. <laughs> got a little bit uh, cooked there. And once again, uh, proving that I too am a person of color. As you can see, I'm pink. So welcome back to the program, folks. I hope everyone's well. Let's say hello. I got Dylan Combrick in here at the outset. Skalk Yandrea says, hey, welcome to you. All the best. Well, thank you so much for that, Skalk. Good to see you there. Lorraine Slavert's back in. Lorraine, always a pleasure. Take the money and run. <laughs> no, no, take the money and run. Show me the money. Show me the money. Uh, thank you. Take the money, Ryan. Ivan Brink is here. How's it? Oh, well, it's okay. Rennie Font, Sue Walsh. I've got a terrible headache right now, folks. I have no idea what it is. Um, uh, you know, I was, uh, you know, in the words of kindergarten cop, it's not a tumor. <laughs> you got a tumor. It's not a tumor. It's just a headache. Anyway, folks, Sue Walsh is here. Pip Jacobs is back. Deborah Moray. Good to see you again. Trevor Bush. 
And Myra's back. Hey, Myra, Ashley Engelbrecht, Nick Muller. And Mike is back here from Pennsylvania. I went to a, a big racetrack yesterday and um, was interviewed during the intermission. And a lot of people very interested in my candidacy. It was really nice to see that. Hang on a second here. Um, I've got more messages. Oh, it's just crap. I'm just trying to sell me stuff. Anyway, so sunstroke from yesterday. No, no, yeah. No, no. Well, I didn't have the headache last night, so it just came today. I had physical therapy again today for that uh, hip, um, and they put me through my paces today. But I had the headache before I got there. I think I might have eaten something bad because my stomach is a little, ooh, you know, it's not just a head. But anyway, as long as a person of color and not interest. <laughs> yeah. Welcome back. Hey, Teresa. And uh, Pollen. Uh, Pollen won't give me a headache. No, 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 no. Um, that's not usually where I get a headache from. So Roy says, if my head looked like that, it would hurt too. Ouch, 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 ouch. Uh, rude people out there in Western Pennsylvania. Thank goodness he's not in my district and can't vote against me. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, it might be a bug. Who knows? Anyway, but let's hope not. Um, we have uh, campaign events tomorrow and Wednesday evening. So I'll be tied up those two evenings. Anyway, but yeah, welcome back, folks. Uh, Menage a is here. I miss Menage a Go Stormers. Indeed, the Stormers uh, looked good this weekend on offense. Their defense, a little bit suspect. Gave up points and never should have given up. Um, I did not even check to see um, very quickly. I was so busy this weekend. I haven't even followed up because I can only cover one URC game this weekend. And uh, did not even cover up or go back, me, go back to see what the results were of the Bulls game. So let's take a look at the Bulls game. I would expect, oh, they won 31 10. I did see that. Leinster won 31 7. The Lions did us a big favor with Connick winning 38 to 14 on the road in Ireland. Wow. Well done at Dexcom Stadium. So, folks, that meant that two South African sides have, were added back into the playoff mix. Three of the four teams are now in the playoffs if they were held tomorrow. Of course, we still got several weeks to go. Vodacom Bulls are up there at number two with nine wins and three losses. Just one game nipping on the heels of Leinster. What a turnaround for the Bulls, who've had two good seasons in the URC. A great one the first season, a good season second. This season, um, they really look better than they did the first two seasons. And so they're in second place. But the Stormers, who were in eighth position or ninth position, have jumped up to fifth position with their bonus point victory and a 7-5 and five record. They're actually in a better position than Edinburgh. The team that they beat because Edinburgh has an eight and four record, but they only have two bonus points, so they fall a full point behind the Stormers. And it depends on how many points you get along. So well done for the Stormers. The Emirates Lions now back in playoff contention in eighth position, six wins, six losses. What a comeback from a terrible start this season. They have 34 points. So top of the log, Leinster 49, then the Bulls 45, Glasgow 44, Munster at 39, Stormers 35, Edinburgh, Ulster, and Emirates Lions all at 34 points. But Edinburgh's eight and four, Ulster seven and five, the Lions six and six, and that's why they're in that order. Well, there you go, folks. Um, that's the reality for United Rugby Championship this weekend, which was really exciting. Uh, good stuff. Stormers, uh, well done by the Lions. Uh, and the Sharks also won. So every South African side won this weekend. You, you couldn't ask for more, could you? I mean, the Sharks came back from the dead and won a game against Ulster at home. Well done to the Sharks. The Lions on the road in Connick, defeating them convincingly. Wow. Then the Stormers winning at home convincingly. Wow. And the Bulls winning convincingly. Now the Dragons are kind of also ran, but that was also on the road. So well done. Well done. Yep. All right. So George Steinberg says, uh, hello, Chris uh, Almal von Heckport. Okay. Okay. Good to see you there. All right. So lots of news to get to. We'll talk about today, but I just want to thank everybody for being here. It's always a distinct pleasure to have you join me. And um, today is National Medal of Honor Day. And of course, that is a decoration, Congressional Medal of Honor, is awarded to. It's not, it, you don't win it, you're awarded that for conspicuous gallantry in combat. Uh, here in Pennsylvania, just down the road from where I live in Newville, we of course have a Medal of Honor recipient, uh, a posthumous Medal of Honor recipient, unfortunately, and that's uh, Sergeant First Class Randy Shugart, Randall Shugart, who was in Black Hawk Down. He and uh, Master Sergeant Gordon jumped in to protect Durant and the crew on that that aircraft, Super 6, that went down there and they were surrounded and pelted. Um, they gave their lives defending Durant and, and then, of course, the reward for that was disgustingly to have their bodies drugged through the streets by vermin uh, disguised as human beings in Somalia. It's uh, But uh, we will never forget uh, Sergeant First Class Randy Shugart. There are two roads nearby here named after that family. Uh, one of them, I believe, is named after him. Um, the Shugart Road, it's, uh, and of course, um, Master Sergeant Gordon, um, two American heroes, 
Yes, next to Mahali's Bird. Yes, I know where it's at, George. I know where it's at. I spent a lot of time up that way. Um, I used to live in Haparone and spent a lot of time um, at the Waterfalls Mall there in Rustenburg. So, yeah, we will never forget them. Uh, I will be doing a video especially to commemorate and recognize and remember National Medal of Honor Day and uh, talking about Gordon and Shugart. I'll be preparing that for the VFW Veterans of War Foreign Wars page and also I'm taking one for my campaign page as a veteran. I owe it to those who came before us who've earned that honor through their gallantry and um, amazing efforts, selfless service to protect and save others. Etienne Roddy's here. John Hooch is here from Arizona. Martin Kay's back. And I think I said Teresa as well. John Dawes says, a Nigerian British journalist that went to Iran yet has a past of being an antagonist of racial discrimination. Unfortunately, the British mainstream media and newspapers eat this crap up. They do, John. They do. Um, he had, you know, this guy had a foregone conclusion. Um, he's just just a, a, an asshat, I think is the right term you're looking for. Yep. Uh, have you ever worked with any Medal of Honor recipients? Um, no, I haven't, to my knowledge, Menage a Croix. I've worked with Silver Star recipients, which is a very high decoration for gallantry as well. Ever been to the Medal of Honor Grove in Valley Forge? I have not. I have not. Uh, I've intended to go to Valley Forge a couple times, and each time something intervened. Actually, when I was on the way there, someone kept me from getting an early enough start to spend time there. Um, I've never been to Valley Forge. Of course, I've been to, you know, the Liberty Bell. I've been to Philadelphia many, many times. I've been to Antietam. I've been to Gettysburg dozens of times, maybe a hundred times by now, Gettysburg. Been to Antietam many, many times. Um, yeah, I've also been to um, some battlefields in the southern states. But yeah, I've never been to Valley Forge. Um, hopefully I will get there. And I've also been to Boston. So yeah, we should do a meetup there. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Uh, Ivan wants to know how I got interested in rugby. Well, it's interesting you should ask that question. I was introduced to rugby as a freshman at university. And uh, the story is more entertaining than the version I'm going to tell. <laughs> In private company, I share the full story. But um, I was um, at a leadership laboratory on a Friday afternoon. Sucks when you do reserve officer training corps, you have leadership labs on Fridays when all the other college students are out getting soused, drinking, enjoying their weekend starting. Most people schedule no classes on Friday, so they get to screw off and have a three-day weekend every weekend. But if you took language classes, language classes were always on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. And if you took ROTC, you always had the lab in the Friday afternoon. So I didn't finish until late afternoon. Anyway, I was a freshman in 1982 when one of the upperclassmen, nice fellows, a black gentleman who later became an officer. I never saw him after that year at ROTC, but he was a really great guy. Um, we, we did our leadership lab and he said, hey, you come into the game tonight. And of course, it was football season, American football. So I said, well, the game's tomorrow. I'll be going to the game tomorrow. He goes, no, 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 not football, rugby. I'm like, listen, man, I'm from Appalachia. We're just happy with paved roads and electricity. These are recent additions to my neighborhood. <laughs> he laughed. He said, no, 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 no. Come on to the game. You'll have a lot of fun. It's down at the band practice fields down by the river, by the Hocking River. Come on down and um, you'll have a great time. You, you'll have, and, and you'll meet, you'll meet folks. You'll meet women. It'd be fantastic. So I went and um, it was, um, I had no idea what was going on. Now, this is when the Entertainment Sports Programming Network, also known as ESPN, had just started shortly before that, a couple years before that, and they didn't have much money at the time, so they were getting rights to sporting events that no one <laughs> wanted to watch, and they cost almost nothing. So they used to show Australian Rules football. So I actually saw Australian Rules football on television, on cable, before I ever became acquainted with rugby. So 1982, I was familiar with Australian Rules football. And so I went down there like, this is not American. We were standing in touch. There were no stands just along the band field there. And they were playing. It's a very flat surface. And um, it's not Australian rules football. It's not American football. But it's kind of cool. Didn't understand the rules. Didn't really get it. But one thing I did understand is one team got beat badly by the other side. And when the game was over, they all shook hands. They came over. Everybody had a beer. They relaxed. They had fun. There were people there, men and women, and they got it. And back in that day, you know, a lot of sports, women weren't that active in sports. And, you know, the stereotype is that women didn't know sports. And it was the reason for a stereotype. A lot of women simply didn't know sports. And so it was interesting to meet women. Um and men at the event who understood the game of rugby and really into it. So that began my interest in uh, rugby. Unfortunately, the United States did not have a national side in 1982. We didn't add a team until 84, 85. I think we formed, we formed a rugby union team. Um, so I had no national side to root for. Since I already had an interest in Africa as a consequence of following the liberation conflicts in Angola, Mozambique, Rhodesia, 
and Southwest Africa. Um, I um, already had an interest in Africa, and I had looked to see which national unions had teams that would be interesting. I didn't want to root for England, um, so I didn't really want to root for the All Blacks because they were so popular and everybody loved them. I was like, well, I root for the team that everybody loves. And Australia didn't appeal to me, so um, I thought about Ireland or Scotland. But I wound up settling on South Africa and becoming a supporter, a fan, which of course is short for fanatic. Um, that's what fans are, they're fanatics. So I became a fanatic for the Springboks, and that was already like a 1982 time frame. So that's when I got interested in rugby, but I couldn't watch it. It was never on television. There was no rugby near me. Then I left after university after a year, went in the Army. I was in Germany, busy with the Cold War, traveling Europe, growing up, um, you know, learning some good habits about how to save and invest <laughs> while still traveling, and prepping to go, going to school at night and then prepping to go back to university. So, uh, you know, rugby really didn't come back across my screen until I went back to college and I got reacquainted with it, saw a little bit of it there. And then when I came back in the Army, it was something of interest to me. So I was able to start um, following rugby with the World Cup in 95. And then the advent of Super 12 rugby, um, I was able to catch that occasionally. And once I started getting uh, living in Africa in the late 1990s, um, of course, um, Super Sport was available because of, um, of multi-choice all over the continent, and that sort of thing as it spread around, and so satellite television. So I was able to watch rugby. And then, yeah, I, uh, from the very outset, have been a... Springboks and a Western Province fan, and then also, of course, a um, Stormers fan. So there you go. So, John Dahl says, if you ever get a chance to visit Rourke's Drift and do the tour, John, not only have I gone to Rourke's Drift, I've gone there multiple times, and I was just there. And I did live broadcasts from Rourke's Drift and from Issan Lawana. In fact, Rise Mzan, not, uh, Mzanzi Patriot, whom I haven't seen on the channel in donkey years, Mzanzi Patriot, who is a black South African Zulu doctor, a physician, which I didn't know, he and his wife met me at Issan Lawana my last time there. Yeah, so let's just go take a look at that. Um, yeah, it's uh, I've not only have I been to Rourke's Drift, I've covered it. I've also been to Blood River. I mean, you name it, I've been pretty much everywhere in South Africa except for Kruger. <laughs> it's one of the few places I haven't been. So let me get to my channel. Okay, let me look for... Um, come on, where's that? So... Battle of Works Drift. Okay, here we go. Here's a short I did. So, let me see. Let's do this real quick. Here we go. There we go. Hey, folks, this is Chris. I'm at Works Drift, where a battle occurred in 1879 between the Brits and the Zulu. And this is the Zulu Memorial, which didn't exist back in 2000 when I last visited here 23 years ago. Around me, that's that memorial's to the Zulu dead. The founder, and the farmer who settled here and cleared down by the Buffalo River, James Rourke, his uh, grave is located up over there. I've gone and seen that recently. And then down here in front of me is where the main part of the battle took place. As Zulu, who defied King Quechua's orders, crossed into Natal across the Buffalo River and attacked the British here at Rourke's Drift. Now, that was a problem. Had the Impi commander that did that been anyone other than the half-brother of King Quechua, probably would have been executed, but apparently he escaped judgment, although a lot of Zulu didn't. They died here at Rourke's Drift in a futile attempt to dislodge the small contingent of Brits that were defending the station here in KwaZulu-Natal. 1879, Rourke's Drift. Hey folks, this is Chris. Yep, so there's that. Um, yep, so, and then as far as Issan Lawana, um, let me see if I, I don't know if I did Is I don't think I actually actually did an Issan Lawana video. No, I did. Here we go. Yeah, I got uh, two of them here, so let's try that. Okay. This is I did. This is not even a short. So, what's going on here? Oh, here we go. All right, let me zoom it up there. This on Luana. Okay, here we go. Yeah, it was a windy day when I was there. Um, this is last year. This on Luana, huge battle between the Zulu and the British who came here in the Anglo-Zulu War, 1879, trying to conquer the Zulu. King Quechua sent his MP to this site after Lord Chelmsford divided his column into three separate columns and went looking for a fight with the Zulu. They kept the trains back here and the Zulu came, overwhelmed them. Mass, tactics, 
just outnumbered and overwhelmed them. Some fugitives tried to get away, carry the queen's colors, but they were killed down by the river. And then after that, the Battle of Rorke's Drift took place. Yep, Isan Luana, 1879. And yep, folks, uh, so that was Isan Luana. Yeah, so I did those. And then Blood River, of course. Let me see if I can find that one. Okay, Battle of Blood River. Here's one here. Now, the sound isn't great on this, unfortunately. Um, this is one I did. It's a little bit longer, so let me bring this one up very quickly here. So this is one I did in Blood River. Now, this was this was brutal. I got cooked out here this day. It was so hot. So here we go. Hello, folks. This is Chris in KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa at the site of a momentous battle that took place here on the 16th of December, 1838. As the Four Trekkers, a group of the descendants of the original European settlers in the Western Cape, the Dutch, the French Huguenots, and the Germans who came later, along with some others, migrated up away from what was then the Cape Colony into the Orange Free State, over the Drakensberg Mountains, down here into KwaZulu-Natal, where they ran into conflict with the Zulu who happened to occupy this area. After a number of events that took place, which uh, takes a little getting into, we're not going to cover that here right now, uh, King Dingani had sent his troops out to meet a Four trucker army that had assembled here. They came here on the Akombe River, subsequently known as Blood River, as a consequence of this battle. 464 truck fours fought at least 16,000 Zulu. Both sides entered this, this battle well aware of what was at stake and what was going on. The truck fours, believing that they were the four vanguard of Christianity and representatives of God, made a pact, a covenant with God that if he would give them a great victory against the Zulu, in retribution for what had happened to Pete Retief and others and at Beenan. If he would give them a great victory, they would take a vow and they would build a church in his honor and they would celebrate that day. So yeah, that's about halfway through that video. So yeah, but I mean, these things I've got 1.2 thousand views. So, I mean, that's something that should have tens of thousands of views, but why am I not live? What's going on here? Am I disconnected? can't get live. It looks like I'm disconnected. Am I still live, folks? <laughs> I'm not live anymore. Am I live? Anyway, okay. Wow. Uh, my software is acting up over here. Um, YouTube. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you for telling me I'm live. Yeah, it's, uh, I know you're about four seconds behind me. Anyway, thank you. Yeah, it's uh, YouTube. They do this all the time. Anyway, so look, I've been to, uh, thank you for asking me to go. Uh, John, I, I cover those things. I've also been to Wyatt Street in Durban many, many times. Every trip to Durban, I always go to Wyatt Street. There's a British museum there. It's named after Lieutenant Wyatt, surname, same as mine, who served in the Anglo- Zulu conflict in 1879, Lieutenant Wyatt. Anyway, it's just down the street from McDonald's. Um, and also the Comrades runs right past there. In fact, Eric and I were at the Comrades, when was that? Last year, August 2022, which whenever the Comrades was, uh, I went to the Comrades and came back with a sign because it was laying on Wyatt Street. It was like trash. They left it laying around. But I got my own Comrades sign and uh, a race that I've always found fascinating, this ultra marathon from Peter Maritzburg down to the sea in Durban and then from Peter Maritz, or from the sea back to Peter Maritzburg the next year. But the Comrades, what I found fascinating is that all these people that are physically out of condition, overweight, obese, running this ultra marathon... I was surprised, but what I'm not surprised by is the number of fatalities. In fact, Eric and I watched someone unfortunately die right there, almost at the finish line for the comrades when we were in Durban. Uh, yeah. And then the young lady who uh, used to watch my program, I don't know if she still does. She was a university student. Uh, she has the same name, unfortunately, as the former uh, public protector, and that's Busizivwe Makwabane uh, in Durban. She uh, happened to catch me live streaming the comrades. I live streamed the comrades. How cool was that, folks? Yeah, let me go back to that. Um, let's see if I can find that. Comrades. Uh, I live streamed the comrades. Yeah, here we go. 2022. So it was 2022 when I did it. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah. Finish in Durban. I, I did. Oh, here's the live stream. 45 minutes. Yeah, let me do that one. So, yeah, that was really cool. Um, yeah, I'll just put it on the screen here and we'll play it. So, yeah, here we go. And now here late in the day, the hour almost closed for this incredibly grueling test that runs from Durban. Now, my beard was a lot longer back then before I trimmed it up. Been one year up to Peter Maritzburg, from Peter Maritzburg down to Durban the next time. I think they've been off because of Rona for the last couple of years. Well, the runners are coming in now. It's five o'clock when it closed. We're approaching that hour. Thousands of runners coming in. Uh, many still jogging, others uh, kind of uh, walking along. Some ladies here, keeping them going, encouraging them. 
as they try to finish the Comrades Ultra Marathon, folks. Here we are in Durban. Came downtown to take a look at Wyatt Street, but it's blocked off because of the Comrades. Watch these folks come in. Thousands of runners here late in the day, wrapping up this grueling 52-mile 50, race. This is tough. You know, I always thought when I was younger, it'd be smart to run it from uh, Peter Maritzburg back down this way. But when you realize the strain on your tendons and your joints, you realize it's better to run it uphill instead of downhill. But it is a grueling ultra marathon, ladies and gentlemen. You can see ahead of you thousands and thousands of runners coming in for the finish after a grueling effort to get here. Superhuman job. You got to respect this kind of commitment and dedication. Yeah, it's just crazy. People still running in the comrades. Um, yeah, so let me jump ahead a little bit there. Yeah, so um, some, my signal wasn't always good as I was on my mobile phone live streaming. So here, this is, I've blown this up too, so you can see people. Now, now here I'm, I've got over by Wyatt Street. It's a little about a block up from Wyatt Street. It's just down the street where the runners are going right now. Yep. All this yes, trouble. Yes. Yeah, people are always no, cheeky. I mean, no. really. Really cheeky. What time are they shutting down? Uh, this. Yes. It's five. That's what I the thought. So, person, yeah. yeah, they're running out of time, aren't they? They got to finish soon. Well, they're doing a brilliant job yeah, so they, far. They end, they end the uh, race at a specific time, and those don't finish, don't finish. But uh, the comrades. So, yeah, another thing I did. Um, yeah, so. Um, and once again, I'm not live. What's going on over here? Okay, so thanks for the 84 people currently here. Just 41 likes. What's going on there, folks? Come on. What's it take? A moment of your time? That was easy. Just push that like button. All right, so let me get back to the chat, and then we'll get back to the news here. Uh, yeah, so I've been a work drift. Jeremy Nurse says 14-man Lions were incredible. Apparently, Steven from Forever Sports is still a man down. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I didn't cover it. Uh, I, I, I did notice that for the Stormers game, I had a huge audience compared to Forever Sports. Thanks for everybody that tuned in for that. It was pretty amazing, but I wasn't able to cover all the games. And, in, and through April 23rd, I won't be able to cover all the games, um, but I will try to make sure I cover all the Stormers games and, if possible, the Bulls games uh, because my campaign, I'm quite busy. So, yeah, hey, Sedgefield's back. Shawnee's here. Okay, what else? Um, and then, uh, who I missed? Oops, things jumped ahead here. I'm live. Uh, Minaj Kwan says, what military figure in history do you admire the most and why? Did you ever work with General Powell? I never worked with General Powell, but I did participate in his change of command ceremony at the 5th Corps headquarters in Frankfurt in 1987 when he took over 5th Corps briefly for nine months so that he could get credit for having a big command like that because they wanted to advance him to the Chairman Joint Chiefs of Staff. Um, I was there um, representing the uh, 8th Infantry Division color guard and we were part of the ceremony so it was interesting been the smithsonian oh yes garrett i've been to almost i think probably every smithsonian museum building in dc um you should really invest in a trigger board such as stream deck uh you mean like this you mean like this is that what you're talking about <laughs> yep i've had it for well over two years and yanni promised to help me with this he never did never did help me anyway so i've set it up so it puts the mic on mute and then it does something else here but yeah i have that yeah that's a one two three four it's a 15 button stream deck yep yeah rj uh enough questions let's have some news okay ken okay okay calm down calm down all right, let's get to the news. All right, so time for the news. Okay, so uh, international media are taking note of South Africa as the elections approach and as its corruption continues to pile up. Let's start first with not corruption, but political scene in South Africa. Let's get to this news. First out of the gate, here we go. Whoops, that is not the right button. <laughs> There we go. That's the right button. Diverse in race, gender, and skill. The Democratic Alliance unveils its election candidates from all walks of life. Unfortunately, I went to the DA website, and I cannot find their list anywhere. Uh, I also went to their Facebook page. I cannot find their list anywhere. I went to every media site. Nobody lists all the candidates. Very annoying. I'm not sure where to find that. Maybe somebody can tell me. Maybe it's on Instagram or Twitter. But uh, here is a sampling of the candidates that will be representing the Democratic Alliance. A doctor, an economist, a communications specialist, a counselor, and a PhD holder from the University of Cambridge in the UK are some of the new faces that will represent the DA in Parliament and provincial legislatures. So, a select number of candidates, Jeanine Adriance, um, who's a senior counselor in J.B. Marx, um, Mondili, uh, Mondili, economist at ThinkPack, Mondili at a think tank, um, Edwin McRae Bath, um, Katsushelo Rasenlangwane, Mark Burke, Ian Cameron, 
We all know who Ian Cameron is. Liam Jacobs, Jacobs, Cabello Copisa, Dulani Leach, Carl LaRue, and Cabello Mojatosi. So there you go. That's just a smattering of the names here. Yep. And there's others, of course. Leon Schreiber will be there. Andrew Whitfield. Of course, we know Andrew Whitfield. I've interviewed Andrew Whitfield in Utenhag when I was there last time. The good party has given the boot to former Springboks coach Peter DeVilliers. He's been booted from the party. What's going on here? We heard allegations about him. Disciplinary hearing. So good has terminated Peter DeVilliers' membership after an internal disciplinary process found him guilty of breaching the party's constitution and code of conduct. He was removed as a member of the Western Cape Legislature. Wow. Good is a woman-led party with a constitution containing a set of values to which all members subscribe and account, irrespective of their positions. Irrespective. Hmm. Uh, advocate Lionel Esau was appointed by the party as an independent chair for disciplinary hearing. Hmm. He was accused in January of sexual misconduct against former Springbok rugby coach turned... Oh, sorry, he is a former... So he was accused of that. Sorry. Yeah, so Peter de Villiers out, booted from the Springboks, Set packing to Namibia to be the coach. Was it Namibia? No, it was Alistair. No, Zimbabwe. And now he's been booted from the good party. What's going on with Peter DeVillier? What's this guy up to? Did he do something wrong? Hmm. Well, international media taking note of South Africa. And as I've warned for a long time, South Africa has made itself ineligible for many things, including the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act. And now U.S. politicians in a bilateral fashion, something rare in the U.S. these days, is coming after South Africa and the gifted money we keep handing South Africans while the ANC pokes us in the eye, undermines our national security, and undermines America's position in the world. Well, the Biden regime and the leftists are actually up in arms about the ANC. Wow, that's crazy. You'd never think that happened. South Africa, Wall Street Journal opinion piece. South Africa joins anti-US axis. The House re-examines trade benefits for our non-friends in Pretoria. Woo! Look, it's Job of the Hut. Job of the Hut. Now, Lady Pandor, the foreign minister of South Africa, right there. South Africa held hands with Hamas in January, charged Israel with genocide, the ICJ. The episode and other developments are causing Congress to re-examine the US relationship with our non-friends in Pretoria. The U.S.-South Africa Bilateral Relations Review Act passed the House Foreign Affairs Committee 36 to 13 with bipartisan support. Wow. While South Africa claims non-alignment, the bill notes that it has a history of siding with malign actors that include Hamas, a recognized terrorist organization, as well as Russia and China. Legislation passed while South Africa Foreign Minister Nalini Pandor was in Washington on the progressive speaking circuit. Well, 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 well. She's trying to make fences here, men fences, but we know that the ANC is hostile to the United States. They're hostile to minorities in South Africa. They are hostile to the West and they should be punished for it. Unfortunately, South Africans will suffer as a consequence of this, but hey, you elect these morons, you pay the price. That's the bottom line. Look, apparently we elected Joe Biden and we've helped destroy the world as a consequence. So, I mean, you can throw that in our lap and blame us for, you know, 81 million votes my butt. Uh, isn't that what the song says? But anyway, yeah, we voted for Joe Biden, apparently, uh, overwhelmingly, according to uh, state voting records. And therefore, we are the ones responsible for the Biden inflation, the massive inflation, the supply chain disruptions, the mask wearing, the mandatory jabs from the pharmaceutical companies that developed them in just, you know, seven months. Uh, we're all responsible for that. So, you know. You know, vote for the ANC, this is what you get. No AGOA, no preferential trade access, um, and you might even see your PEPFAR money disappear. That would be devastating for South Africans suffering from HIV, whose CD4 count has dropped below 200. Not good. And for a younger generation of South Africans just becoming sexually active, uh, who will not get um, some decent education as a consequence of abstinence and being responsible, uh, with their sexual conduct, condomize, all that stuff, ABC. Uh, that will be something that will fall on deaf ears because we know the ANC doesn't care to protect South Africans or to share proper behavior with them. They're all for misconduct. That's what the ANC is all about. So that loss of PEPFAR money, should it happen, will be devastating for South Africans. Yep. Uh, Marilyn says things are going to get a lot more expensive. Uh, no one voted for Sleepy John. <laughs> <laughs> USA has never appeared to be as weak as it currently is. Uh, RJ, I would dispute that slightly. Uh, in 1979, the United States was actually, in my view, even weaker than this. Um, yeah, so just a second here. Sorry about that campaign-related, folks. Um, yeah, so anyway, 
Yeah, no, I think in 1979, America was even weaker. And this is what drove me into the arms of a reformed former liberal who became one of the most staunch conservatives in America and our president, former California governor, Ronald Reagan. Yeah, um, so, yeah. Anyway, what else? Maybe they should uh, pay for price for sexual promiscuity. Well, yeah, that's harsh, though, uh, when people aren't raised properly. But Ramaphosa is delusional. Cyril Ramaphosa, the uh, supposed president of South Africa, the leader of the angry, naughty children, is saying that, uh, listen, the tensions between the United States and South Africa really aren't that bad, as here he embraces and swaps saliva with his friend, the totalitarian fascist Vladimir Putin. President Ramaphosa says South Africa's relationship with the United States is not in jeopardy and that misinformation about the recent genocide case against Israel won't stop the countries from working together. Really, Cyril? Tell us more fairy tales. Ooh, Hansel and Gretel. Tell us more. Tell us more. Wow. Um, there will be a price to pay. And I guarantee you, if, if the House committee votes 36 to 13, to review and suspend our relations with our generous relations. By the way, it's not just PEPFAR, $640 billion per year in HIV assistance. It's not just preferential access to our trade markets. <laughs> Folks, remember that the morons in the Biden regime promised South Africa $9 billion in just energy transformation money so you don't burn coal. So the ANC has been not burning coal so that they get money Green mail from Europe and from the U.S. Guess what? Much of that money was coming from us. That money is now in jeopardy. So the ANC was counting on that billions and billions of dollars coming from the West. But remember, this is the party that its leadership, its leadership the hippopotami himself, well, not hippopotamus, the hippopotami is all of the pod of hippos from the ANC. But the hippopotamus himself, the squirrel Cyril Ramaphosa, ran around the planet screaming from the top of his lungs, Vaccine apartheid, vaccine apartheid, vaccine apartheid. Claiming, I sound like Count Chocula. Oh, one. <laughs> no, but vaccine apartheid. Remember that? Remember that? Ooh, yes, the evil white people and the rest who, who experimented. And remember, they lied about this. Oh, they're going to experiment on black Africans with the Rona vaccine. Remember, remember those lies? I told you they were lies. Oh, it's typical. They're, they're, they're oppressing black people with these jabs. Um, no, the problem is that virtually every single homo sapien who played any role in a trial run of the jabs from Pfizer and Moderna and all the other clowns like Glasgow Smith Klein who were responsible for this injection tested white people in Europe, UK specifically, and all over the United States. We were the guinea pigs. We were the guinea pigs. But the African leaders, the leftist media, Cyril Ramaphosa, Oh, claiming that the jabs were being tested on black Africans. But they're not complaining now that we're testing tuberculosis jabs in South Africa, where you've got so many people with tuberculosis. They're not complaining about that. It's a field test. You go where the affliction is. You don't go to the Canary Islands where two people have it. You go to the place where it's concentrated. And the Rona was concentrated here in the United States after the Chinese um, affliction found its way here. So vaccine apartheid. Remember that? Remember that scam? Remember the scam? Yeah, it's all scam. Um, this guy who insulted us, we took the risk. We spent the billions developing. We were responsible for producing it. When South Africa has its own domestic pharmaceutical industry. Has anyone heard of Aspen Pharmacare? $711 million dollars. Aspen Pharmacare, August 2022. Remember that? Ooh, yeah, yeah, or 2021. They got $711 million from the US and from the European Union directly to the company Aspen Pharmacare to make jabs for Africans because South Africa was supposed to be a place where the jabs were made. We gave them the recipe. We gave them the centrifuges. We gave them the money to produce it. And to this date, not a single jab, to my knowledge, if there is, feel free to correct me, has ever been delivered by Aspen Pharmacare to any black African or Arab or mixed race or Asian African on the planet. Not a single, single jab. Where'd that money go? Where'd the money go? Yep. Yes, it's the angry, naughty children. I coined that a long time ago. A lot of people have been saying it since then, but I haven't said it much lately. Yep. Ah, uh, boy. 
Yes, absolutely. Got it. Remember this one. I'll be using that one too, if you don't mind. No, you can use it, Lorraine. Feel free to credit me. Um, it was because the French researchers who said the jabs should be tested on Africans. Oh, LMC. So because some idiot French researcher said that, that means that Western pharmaceutical companies who took the risk by jabbing overwhelmingly white folks are racist. Spare me. I'm not, that's not directed at you, LMC. It's directed at the French and the idiots who followed up on that. You know, what people say and what they do are two different things oftentimes. Oftentimes. So it's what people do that matter. <laughs> they were testing on Africans and didn't pay. Where's our cut? Yeah, no kidding. Never. T um, okay. Anyway, so, hey, more international coverage. This from the leftist Guardian talking about Speaker of Parliament, no sezivwe mapisa. Nakwala. Yeah, let's talk about her. Well, they're pointing this out, how she is accused of taking $135,000 in bribes and a wig. <laughs> Look, ANC politicians are so stupid. So stupid. If you're going to compromise your principles, if you are going to take a bribe, it better be worthwhile. $135,000 and a wig? <laughs> South African prosecutors said today they intended to charge parliamentary speaker with corruption. Allegedly, she took $135,000 and a wig and bribes over a three-year period while she was the defense minister. Yeah, no se sivue mapisa na kula. The speaker of the National Assembly has not been arrested or charged because she's an ANC politician. She'll never go to jail. In court papers submitted for the hearing, prosecutors say that she received 11 payments totaling $135,000 between December 2016 and July 2019. She tried to get another bribe of $105,000, but they refused to pay it. Wow! This is your ruling party. This is the African National Congress, folks. Welcome. Congratulations for the pariah behavior of a typical liberation movement turned oppressive political party. It's a story as long as the post-colonial history of Africa. One country after another, this is what happens. Look at ZANU-PF. Look at SWAPO. Look at the MPLA in Angola. <laughs> My goodness. But this story in The Guardian. When the leftists report your malfeasance, you know you're in the caca. You know that things have gone seriously wrong when Democrats in Congress who are perfectly okay excusing the racist legislation, which is far more pervasive than the apartheid era, but the racist legislation from the ANC, well, they excuse it and look the other way. Pay no attention to the racism and bigotry going on in South Africa because it's our racists and our bigots in the Democratic Party. We like those racists and bigots in the Democratic Party. So pay no attention to the oppression of Indians, of colors, and of whites in South Africa. Because, of course, the historical problem of apartheid, that, of course, is the excuse from 20. 24 until 3,967, when finally someone will forget what apartheid was and blame the majority who destroyed the country. Yeah, so, mm -hmm, that's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, expect more Roblox this weekend in South Africa, folks, and here in America, too. It's Easter weekend, and of course, people will be boozing it up. So, South African Police Service will be out in force with Roblox and road checks for public safety. Various provinces and the National Department of Transport have launched a policing campaign for the coming long weekend looking to clamp down on road abusers over the busy Easter period. Thousands of motorists expect to take holiday destinations this weekend as South Africans celebrate religious or leisure's time over the Easter weekend. Department of Transport headed by Minister Sindiziwe Chikunga launched its road safety campaign on March 20th. Over 12,000 people die on South Africa's roads each year. Good Lord. It's down from 14,000, but still 12,000 people. I mean, I think we lose like 30,000 people in a country with millions of miles of roads and with a population six times as large as South Africa. That's crazy. That's crazy. There's also a scandal about her smuggling an illegal person in an Air Force plane. Yeah, that's to Zimbabwe and also misusing um, South African aircraft. Yeah, that's correct. They they took party favorites up to Zanu PF to visit them. Yep. Has only been reprimanded by Cyril. Literally sent to sit in a corner for 30 minutes. Ridiculous, actually. Let's see. Now, nothing will come of it, Lorraine. Don't hold your breath. Any embezzler, full stop, doesn't seem to go to jail. Kind of exclusion clause. Yeah, Debbie, that's a good point. They want to add a white light in the current three lights in our robots. <laughs> no. What's the white light for, Debbie? <laughs> Proceed at your own risk. <laughs> it's green, amber, red, white. Proceed at your own risk. 
<laughs> well, software, German software giant SAP. Uh, interest of full disclosure, I have a small number of shares in SAP and have had it in them for 20 years. Uh, SAP, a very successful software company, is going to pay 500 million rand because of shady ESCOM deals. Well, look, one of the Guptas there. It's Artul Gupta. What a goober looking SOB. German software giant SAP agreed to pay the special investigating unit uh, 500 million within seven days over corruption contracts at ESCOM. It stems from two invalid contracts that SAP entered into with the utility between 2013 and 2016. Well, the ANC and more corruption. Who would have guessed? Who would have guessed? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, um, the woman, the so-called Sangoma, who was arrested and then released over supposedly being involved in the disappearance of little Jocelyn Smith, now is claiming she was tortured by the police. I was beaten under my feet, on my knees, poured with water and suffocated with plastic. The woman who alleged to have been the son Goma involved in the disappearance of Jocelyn Smith has broken her silence since she's been released. Pumza Sigakwa was among those arrested alongside Jocelyn's mother, Kelly Smith, and others. It's been alleged that Jocelyn was sold for 20,000 rand to a son Goma. However, on March 13th, the state withdrew all charges against Sigakwa and she was released from custody. The others remain in custody. She had a sit down with Newsroom Africa during the weekend and expressed how she was allegedly tortured by police. Real that, that Smith admitted in the doc during their first court appearance that she was pregnant. Sigakwa told the broadcaster that she had a suspicion that Bota knew more than what he led on. Anyway, that's not really important. I want to hear about her torture. She claimed that she was coerced into confessing after hours of torture at the hands of police and that people close to her needed to speak up about where Jocelyn is. I was called into a boardroom where they asked and they asked where Jocelyn was and if I knew Jocelyn. I told them I knew her. She said police told her she needed to be truthful. As Bote and Von Rain already claimed they left Jocelyn with her at 1 p.m. on the day of the disappearance. He said, she said, I was shocked at the revelation. I was again told to tell the truth. I was beaten under my feet, on my knees, poured with water and suffocated with plastic. During this ordeal, I was repeatedly asked to tell the truth. I asked which truth. I was forced to admit that Jocelyn was indeed left in my care. But she claimed she was willing to die for her truth. She said a female police officer said she needed to be put in a machine. However, the male officer said they cannot as she could die. She has no idea what machine they're talking about. Good Lord. So saps are torturing suspects. That's not acceptable. What is it, the 1930s? Herba Mashaba is unapologetic about xenophobic comments and shutting down and kicking out foreign nationals who are illegitimately in South Africa. Are they xenophobic? I don't think so. Uh, but he's accused of that. So Herman Mashaba from Action SA launched the party's manifesto this weekend. He said the party would create 4.8 million jobs and end load shedding in two years. Listen, nothing against Herman Mashaba. But he's a businessman and he knows better. Governments don't create jobs. Governments destroy jobs. Governments can only ensure a level playing field, a functioning judiciary suit can sue and seek redress of a grievance with another party and security. That's what a government can do. Government doesn't create jobs. They steal money from other people and create fewer jobs and destroy the free market. So Herman Mashaba should know better than that. He's not going to create 2.8 million jobs unless what he's saying is that they're going to create the conditions that allow private sector to create these jobs. Uh, he does say there'll be no coalition with the EFF this year, Herman Mishaba. Yep. He says, we are not going to have a coalition with EFF. Well, good for you, Herman Mishaba. I've interviewed him, of course. Um, interesting man. So, the whitest place on earth, ladies and gentlemen. Apparently, Aranya, which is orange, um, allegedly traumatized a black journalist. Now, this, I don't know what I call this guy. Is he a fraud? I don't know. You tell me. What I can tell you is that this guy is dishonest based on what happened here. So Yus Schreidem, um reported that this guy dis disobeyed. He was allowed to come cover Orania. He did, but obviously had preconceived notions and meant to destroy Orania. So he went into a church service and was filming. Now listen, you can't enter a mosque and film. If you're not even a Muslim, you can't enter a mosque. So this gentleman was given access to the community and he abused it and betrayed the community and then lied about them. So let's take a look at this story here. The black journalist, <laughs> yeah, a British journalist who claims to be the first black man to have spent a full week in Aranya has left residents of this Northern Cape Town scratching their heads as to where he gets his facts. Well, he makes them up. Ade Adeptian, who is wheelchair bound, recently launched a documentary entitled Whites Only, 
Adi's Extremist Adventure on UK's Channel 4. And the fact that UK airs this filth and racist garbage is disgusting. Uh, he's in Wheelchair Bound, recently launched a documentary. Um, he, in it, he makes several statements such as that Irania is the whitest place on earth. So, Yu Stridham, CEO of the Irania uh, settlement, says in response to many of his statements are debatable. He also believes that the journalist visited the town with the deliberate intention of creating a distorted image of it. Yust and Aranya's management were apparently under the impression the documentary would focus on Aranya's policy of self-determination. He said, I can't give exact dates and names, but there have been black journalists who have been entertained here for longer. Furthermore, in the two rounds of negotiations and in his 10-day visit, they communicated that their focus was on service delivery compared with other towns in the area and elsewhere in the country. But he added that the sensational attack does not surprise him. I didn't expect anything else from a British mainstream media channel. In Europe, there are many preconceived notions about Iranian journalists here arrive, often friendly during their visit, but completely distort the narrative afterwards. Channel 4 streaming service described the launch of the documentary uh, as Ade becomes the first black man to spend a week in Iran. He tries to understand the residents' beliefs and their cultural project of the town. Uh, Deptian says at the beginning of the documentary that he's visiting Iran because the rise of right-wing politics, uh, excuse me, the rise of right-wing politics, what do right-wing politics have to do with Iranya? Iranya is a settlement of people who crazily live in the middle of nowhere because they just want to be with their own folks. Yeah, um, there's nothing political, nothing political about that. Um, the right to self-determination and cultural protection is guaranteed in South Africa's constitution. Now, did Mr. Adaptian travel to KwaZulu-Natal and visit black-only settlements? Did he? Did he? Did he, did he get to go to those places? No, I don't think so. Yeah. He's apparently a Paralympian. He's also apparently a real big bullshitter. Yeah, it's the South Africa to take it a step further and have built the village only for white people. After months of negotiations, I'll be the first black man to live there. Well, first off, that is factually a lie. A lie. So I will call him a liar because that's a lie. That is not a village for whites only. If you are a person who is Dutch Calvinist and who speaks Afrikaans and accepts Afrikaans and Afrikaner cultural norms, you can live there. Collard folks are welcome to live there. In fact, the 178,000 black South Africans whose first language is Afrikaans could probably live there just fine. This is a lie. One perpetrated yet again about Aranya. Because apparently it's okay for some groups to isolate themselves and self-segregate. You know, like black-only fraternities and black-only sororities. But other groups can't do that. Because then they're racist. If a whites-only fraternity is racist, then all black fraternities are racist who exclude whites. Simple as that. Or maybe the truth of the matter is, very few white folks are interested in being a black fraternity where the purpose of the black fraternity is to uplift and promote black students, no one else. So maybe that's why there's no whites there. To me, the Iranians look like racist, he said, but I'll put aside my preconceived notion to see if separatism can be justified. Really? Apparently he didn't. During the course of the 45-minute bullshit documentary, he conducts interviews with residents to include a real estate agent, a teacher, pupils from school, and management members of the town. He visited a rehearsal of the school's theater production, the launch of his latest version of local currency, the Aura, and the Afrikaans Protestant Church after service. And that's where things started to go wrong. Um, he said that it wasn't very church-like behavior. We only wanted to conduct an interview with the minister, but we were turned away by bouncers. They have bouncers at the church here in Aranya. Uh, no, they probably have security people there because um, people threaten their lives. So, you know, stop being dishonest. Um, he was trying to film in the church. But he won't tell you that if he went to a mosque, he would be kicked out. You know, so just lie, lie, lie. LMC says, to be fair, that's a recent line. Well, originally, they were very clear that Ronnie was white off her counter. Correct, LMC, but... The formation of Aranya in the late 1980s and the existence of Aranya under Yus Stridum's management in 2024 are very different realities. The African National Congress purported to be a liberation movement in 1990. Of course, it murdered thousands of Inkata members, 20,000 approximately, in the 1990s. So not much of a liberation movement there. But the ANC of 1995 is not the ANC of 2024. Things change, folks. Things change. Anyway, so yeah. Yeah, well, Patriotic Alliance um, Western Cape premier candidate, Gayton McKenzie, says that the DA is telling you a lie. 
and LMC agrees. Right, LMC, thank you. We do agree on that. Um, you know what? This The thing with Iranian is just so much. I mean, nobody will watch my video, but at this point, uh, on my next trip to South Africa, I think I'm just going to go to Iranian. I mean, I've interviewed Yus Schreidem four years ago on the program. I've met with him in Pretoria when we had the launch of, of um, Ernst von Sales' documentary about uh, Selt Bastille. Um, so um, I think it's finally time to go to Aranya. Of course, you know, Roman went there too, but it's time for me to go to Aranya, I think. So yeah, we'll try that. The Black Pen was there the other day. What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that there is a world full of racists white and black, who will believe any lie, any fiction, any twist or narrative. And I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about that. So I'm, I, I love to play devil's advocate where I twist these things around. Everybody should be treated the same, but they're not. And Angel Reese did what she did, what she did this weekend in the game with LSU against Middle Tennessee. Was it racist? If a white player had done to Angel Reese what she did to the white player who fouled out We'd hear racism all day. So I'm going to show you that here in a little bit. So hang tight, folks. Alex Stockel's back. Hey. All right. So premier candidate, Gate McKenzie. He says that he believes the DA is naive. They think they'll govern the Western Cape after 29. Now, see, he says they're naive. All right. But then this report says, he says they lied. So which is it, Gate McKenzie? Is the DA naive? Which they could be. Or are they lying? They can't be both. You can't be telling a story and you claim they're naive because that's the story they tell. But then you claim they're liars. It doesn't work. So, Gate McKenzie, you know, language matters. Words matter. Ladies and gentlemen, words matter. And this is this case right here. So, McKenzie says the DA is naive if they think they'll govern. He said, speak in News 24's question and answer podcast. He said the Western Cape would be under a coalition government and the DA was in much more trouble in that province than the ANC is nationally. He added, I can put down any amount of money. I can put down the biggest bet of my life. The Western Cape will be a coalition. The DA has kept this lie alive to gullible people that they're not in trouble in the Western Cape. They are bigger trouble. They're in bigger trouble than ANC nationally. So he said in 2016 to 2021, they'd seen a drop in support in its strongest constituency, the Western Cape. And compared to the more than 800,000 votes it got in 2016, it only got 500,000 in 2021 elections. Okay. Well, that's a municipal level, and there are so many parties competing. It's a very different story than national elections. But McKenzie might be onto something. But he can't make the claim that they're naive because they believe it and then claim that they're lying to you. So make your mind up, Gabe McKenzie. It's one or the other, not both. Bring back the death penalty, says the African transformation movement. Woo! People want to bring back the death penalty in South Africa. How about you enforce the laws? Wow. The African Transformation Movement launched its manifesto in Joburg on Sunday. And they had a decent-sized crowd there based on that photograph. Yeah. They want to bring back the death penalty. But not only that, they'll also encourage police officers to shoot to kill criminals as part of their law and order strategy. Wow. On Sunday, party president Vuyo Zungula presented the ATM's manifesto to party supporters at a rally at Jabulani Amphitheater in Soweto. He told the Pact Amphitheater his party was non-apologetic about its race, radical views on dealing with criminality should it come to power, including backing the death penalty, which was outlawed in 1995. The death penalty is going to be a reality under ATM government. Under the ATM government, we're not going to protect people who do not respect the right of life of others. And listen, I appreciate your sentiments, uh, Vuyo, but here's the thing. You're not going to run South Africa. Neither is a good party. <laughs> it ain't going to happen. Ain't going to happen. Ain't going to happen. Well, we're using the MK to take back the ANC. So Jacob Zuma admits the purpose of the MK party is to reclaim the ANC from the Ramaphosa faction, as if such a thing actually exists. Nobody likes Ramaphosa. They just don't want Zuma there. So, yep. Jacob Zuma says the ultimate plan of the MK party is to reclaim the ANC. Speaking outside the electoral court. Wow. Wow. He's addressing supporters in Bloemfontein Tuesday afternoon where the electoral court heard the NC's application to have the MK party registration declared unlawful. Zuma said the MK party was elected government. They would purge the cruel ones in the ANC. Wow. We're going to bring it back because the ANC is the legacy of our elders. When we were in charge of the government, we we're going to bring it back to us and get rid of the cruel ones. We'll never give it to them. We, When we've won, we're really going to discuss real politics. What are real politics, Jacob Zuma? Um, does it involve the Guptas? Arms gate? Travel gate, oil gate, PPE theft, racist policies. All of that happened on your watch, buddy. All of that happened on your watch. 
Except the travel gate and oil, oil gate, yeah. So what's going to be coming out of this there, Jay-Z? Come on, Jay-Z, tell us what's going on. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going live now to Gauteng, where, well, Bloemfontein, he's in Bloemfontein, sorry, he's in Bloemfontein, where one Jacob Zoom is on the phone. Yes, uh, Mr. Zuma. That's correct. This is Chris in Pennsylvania. We're just curious. What exactly do you mean take back the ANC? Aren't you now affiliated with the MK party? Isn't your goal to unseat the ANC? Oh, I see. So you're just using the MK as a front so you can punish the ANC, get rid of the Ramaphosa crowd, if such a thing exists, and take over. Got it. So what happens to MK afterwards? I mean, it's a party based on the personality. It's just like EFF. Without Juju Malema, it doesn't exist. Cope without Terra Lakota doesn't exist. And of course, MK without Jacob Zuma doesn't exist. All right. All right. Thanks. Sawabona. Sawabona, brother. I see you. I see you. Ciao. All right, folks. Jacob Zuma live from Bloemfontein. <laughs> All right. African National Congress Treasurer General says, I mean, he's got money, man. We got money. We just got a, a wire transfer from Tehran. <laughs> they didn't say that. They didn't say that. That was sarcasm, folks. That was sarcasm. Yeah, the PA without Gate McKenzie does not exist. Yes. Uh, ANC Treasurer General Defense Party Finances says they're stable. They're stable. That's right. Uh, City Press reported last week the party was in financial crunch ahead of the election. Sources claim the party was unable to raise enough funds to print election material because of insufficient funds. Wow. Mm, Gwen Ramakopa. Is she related to the electric slide minister? You can do it. It's electric. Boogie, woogie, woogie. Is she, <laughs> Chris and Yenso Ramakopa. Is she related to him? Yeah. She reiterated the NC was on track towards a sustainable financial situation. Just be patient while the payments come in from Beijing, Moscow, and Tehran. Those wire transfers will happen very quickly through the alternative transfer network. <laughs> Well, the United Nations Security Council unanimously passes a, an immediate ceasefire demand a resolution uh, in Hamas's war on Israel. Wow. Talk about betrayal. So NATO can invoke Article 5 when the United States is attacked by terrorists on September 11, 2001, and the world rallies to America's cause. When terrorists attack, murder, but look, look, the terrorists of 9-11 flew planes in the buildings. People died horrific deaths, but they died almost instantaneously in many cases. Whereas the terrorists from Hamas who invaded Israel on October 7th, 2023, grabbed women, gang raped them, cut their breast off, and then shot them in the head. They put babies in ovens and microwaves and cooked them alive. They dismembered people. They executed civilians on October 7th. Yet the world has now betrayed Israel a state attacked by terrorists, the legitimate government of Gaza, mind you, that invaded Israel with thousands of terrorists attacking thousands of civilians, innocent people. And now the United Nations undermines whatever credibility it may have left by demanding, including the United States, demanding a ceasefire. United Nations Security Council passed its first resolution calling for a Gaza ceasefire after four failed attempts. The United States abstained, which allowed it to pass. The resolution, of course, did allow to pass because jackass Joe Biden's corrupt regime wants Israel to collapse. They want Benjamin Netanyahu out of office because they can't make money off the grift with him there. The resolution, wracked by 14 nations, including China and Russia, demands immediate ceasefire during the holy month of Ramadan, release of all hostages. So, did the UN demand immediate ceasefire when the Arabs attacked Israel during Yom Kippur? I don't know. I know the answer to that. Did they do that? Did they demand immediate ceasefire in 1973? I remember the Arab nations started an oil embargo and we had to stand in line for hours for gasoline because the idiots in this country allowed us to become dependent on foreign imports. Hmm. A 6.9 magnitude on the Richter scale earthquake has hit in the Pacific region in remote Papua New Guinea, killed at least three and nearly a thousand homes destroyed. Port Moresby, Papua New Guinea reports a magnitude 6.9 earthquake has hit a remote part of the western Papua New Guinea, killing at least three people and causing extensive damage. It rocked the East Sepik region at 6.20 a.m. on Sunday near the town of Ambunti, 470 miles northwest of the capital port Moresby, Moresby, at a depth of 25 miles or 40 kilometers. Wow. 
the flooding actually covers an area of more than 800 kilometers long, and so there's about 60 or 70 villages involved all along the Sepik River. Local emergency crews were already active in the region because of the flooding when the earthquake struck. Wow. Japan apparently is trying to have negotiations and discussions with North Korea's out-of-control despotic leadership. North Korea says Japan's prime minister offered to meet with their leader Kim Jong-un soon. North Korea said by that Japan's prime minister is offered to meet with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, but stressed that prospects for the country's first summit in 20 years would depend on Tokyo tolerating the North's weapons program and ignoring its past abductions of Japanese nationals. Of course, the Koreans have kidnapped Japanese nationals multiple times in the past and held them prisoner and hostage. Shamima Begum, the ISIS bride, has lost another case. Shamima Begum suffered another blow in her bid to return to Britain as she lost an initial bid to challenge removal of her UK citizenship at the Supreme Court. The ISIS bride had traveled to Syria back in 2015 when she was 15 years old and her citizenship was revoked on national security grounds shortly after she was found in a Syrian refugee camp in February of 2019. Last year, the 24-year-old lost a challenge against the decision Special Immigration Appeals Commission, which said the removal of her citizenship was lawful despite her lawyers insisting she was a victim of trafficking. Earlier this year, three judges of the Court of Appeal unanimously dismissed her bid to overturn that decision. Today, a judicial spokesman confirmed that Ms. Begum had asked the Court of Appeal for the green light to take her case to Supreme Court, but been refused. So, there you go. Here she is. Evil, disgusting, vile person who promoted the horrific treatment of Yazidi, Jews, Christians, and others. Dismissing her Court of Appeals challenge last month, the Lady Chief Justice... Baroness Carr said it would be argued the decision in Ms. Begum's case was harsh. <laughs> it could also be argued that Ms. Begum is the author of her own misfortune, but it is not for this court to agree or disagree with either point of view. The only task of the court was to assess whether the deprivation decision was unlawful. Since it's not, her appeal is dismissed. Good. Evil, evil, evil. Evil, evil incarnate. These people who rushed off these evil vile non-Europeans in Europe's midst who betray Europe and who do not adopt the ways and norms and mores and values of the societies that welcome them in and then betray. I have no business. Send her home. Yep. And home is not the UK. Vladimir Putin declares a national day of mourning for the victims of this horrific Moscow concert hall terror attack. Wow. Vladimir Putin declared a national day of mourning on Sunday for the victims of terrorist attack where more than 130 people died, an attack the U.S. officials tried to warn the Russian president about. Flags were lowered to half staff across Russia as crowds left flowers and lit candles at makeshift memorial outside the Crocus City Hall concert area. Crazy stuff. Ukraine. Well, Moscow, not Ukraine. The terror attack suspects appear in court. They're beaten and bruised. Well, I'm not surprised after what they did, but it's not acceptable for this. Russia's warning against uh, being blaming Kiev. Four men, Russia says, were involved in the deadly shootings at the concert hall in the outskirts of Moscow Friday and appeared in court late on Sunday. The men were charged with committing an act of terrorism when they appeared in the Basmani District Court, accused of carrying out an attack at the Crocus City Hall concert venue, in which 137 concert goers were killed and at least 140 were injured. Islamic State has said it was behind the attacks. The suspects, three of whom confirmed as Tajik nationals, appeared in the Basmani District Court late last night. Looking disheveled and disoriented, one of the suspects was wheeled into court with another had a bandage removed from his eyes, revealing a black eye. Suspects were identified as Shadakrami Muradali Rasha Belezol. I'm not going to try to pronounce the rest of these names. Uh, will be in custody until May 22nd, pending a trial. And they'll face life in prison if found guilty. Wow. So there you go. The United States is dismissing uh, Russia linking shooting to Ukraine as Kremlin propaganda. Well, it is true that they were fleeing towards Ukraine. So whether they're affiliated with Ukraine or not, it's a whole other story, but they did go towards Ukraine. Well, I've told you about this story for a long time here, folks, and that's that the Germans foolishly uh, fostered a solar panel industry only to create tax credits because nobody wanted to buy the panels. And they thought that that would lead to a huge production and German industrial growth. Unfortunately, those solar panel credits were taken advantage of by underselling, undercutting, selling at less than cost Chinese solar panels, which destroyed the German solar panel industry. Those who are left are begging for subsidies to keep their few factories open. And once again, the elites will take care of their friends. 
Germany's solar panel industry, once a leader, is getting squeezed. Domestic manufacturers are caught between China's low prices and U.S. protectionist policies, even as demand increases. Hmm. Before China came to dominate the solar panel industry, Germany led the way. It was the world's largest producer of solar panels. Several startups clustered in the former East Germany until a decade ago when China ramped up production and undercut just about everyone on price. Now, as Germany and the rest of Europe try to reach ambitious goals to cut their greenhouse gas emissions, the demand for solar panels has increased. But German factories are suffering. Here's a worker at the Meyer Borger in Talheim, Germany, packing solar cells for shipping. Yeah, okay. Yep. So the Germans subsidized the industry and the Chinese took advantage of it and they destroyed their domestic industry. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Ireland has a new prime minister, folks. This guy is like 37 years old. He's still wiping his nappies. Um, so here you go. Ireland set for the youngest ever prime minister after Simon Harris wins leadership of the governing party. He could use a shave. He's kind of creepy looking for a 37-year-old, isn't he? Ireland's governing party, uh, Fine Gael, has named Simon Harris as a new leader, paving the way for him to succeed former Prime Minister Leo Varadkar, who just resigned after coming to see Joe Biden. He'll be the youngest Teosach in Irish history. That's, of course, the Prime Minister at 37. And there he is getting a hug. He's got a lot of gray hair for a 37-year-old. I'm just saying. I'm a lot older than 37. All right. Well, Death in Paradise star Ralph Little is gone. Sorry if I if I ruin the surprise for some folks, but he's gone. He's gone. He has left Death in Paradise. He broke his silence after an emotional final episode. In a video posted on Instagram following the show, he posted a long message to his fans and said he was an absolute privilege to play Neville's. So he said, uh, so there, there you have it. The secret's out. My time on St. Marie has come to an end. But what an end. Wow. D.I. Neville Parker. He was there four and a half years on the show, did five seasons. He could use a shave. He doesn't quite look the same with that beard. <laughs> well, Donald Trump arrived at court this morning. Um, this room should look, courtroom should look familiar, and he called everything a hoax. Let's see what the Trumpsters got to say here as he showed up for a court appearance in New York. This is a witch hunt. This is a hoax, says Donald Trump at his appearance in court, uh, New York courtroom, uh, about the hush money. Of course, this is the money that his attorney, his former attorney, paid and then got caught perjuring. He committed the crimes, not Donald Trump. So I don't know why Donald Trump is on trial here. But um, as anything else, it's an effort to get Trump yeah, and destroy America. Boeing's chief executive officer is stepping down and not immediately. Why is he waiting till the end of the year? Well, I guess he likes the paycheck. Uh, yeah. So Dave Calhoun will step down in the wake of the 737 MAX struggles. He'll be replaced. Chief Executive Officer Dave Calhoun said he would step down at the end of the year as part of a broader shakeup after the recent production problems at the aircraft maker Spark Scrutiny. Well, he's leaving. Interesting. Well, the abomination, the abusive $1.2 trillion of deficit spending that the corrupt Congress in Washington, D.C. is approving to bury us further in debt and destroy and bastardize our currency includes all kinds of woke causes that have no business being funded by government. Yep. Millions to help teens take steps to change their gender. Buried in the newly passed $1.2 trillion federal spending package are millions of dollars for woke causes, including groups that host drag shows and provide teens seeking to change their sex with gender-affirming hormones and underwear. Conservatives flagged a bevy of earmarks for pet congressional causes in the 1,012-page minibus that cleared the Senate Saturday, such as $400,000 for the Garden State Equality in New Jersey, which promotes free gender-affirming garments. They include chest binders used to flatten female chest and gaffs designed to help minimize the appearance of a crotch bulge. The earmark was requested by Senators Cory Booker and Bob Menendez of New Jersey. It's not crazy to say that the federal government should not be subsidizing trans clothing for minors, said Ralph Norman of South Carolina. Advancing American Freedom, a conservative group founded by former Vice President Mike Pence, ticked off a list of the packages Good, Bad, and Ugly, the list of which included 400000 for Briar Patch Youth Services earmarked by Senator Tammy Baldwin, a Wisconsin Democrat. The organization's Teens Like Us LGBTQIA2s program offers counseling and gender-affirming clothing, according to Advancing American Freedom. Democrats trying to push a $400,000 earmark for an organization giving confused 13-year-olds binding and tucking clothing without parental permission. The group said the federal government should not be subsidizing trans clothing for minors. Wow. 
Conservatives also highlighted three hundred fifty thousand dollars for the NAACP in Connecticut, seven hundred forty thousand dollars to increase diversity in state contracting in Maryland, and two million for La Clinica, an Oregon clinic that provides gender affirming hormone therapy for adults and adolescents. Uh, eight hundred forty-five thousand for Envision U of Denver, an LGBTQ mental health organization hosted by drag shows, and advocating the removal of Oklahoma Superintendent of Public. Instruction, Ryan Walters, a critic of gay student rights. $740,000 for Entre Hermanos in Seattle. $740,000 for a Latino LGBT organization in Seattle. When I clicked on the webpage, I got invited to a drag brunch in April, says Representative Norman. Other flag year marks include $200 million to the U.S. Agency for National Development for Gender Equity and Equality Action Fund and $32 million for the United Nations Population Fund. Wow, this is just sick and evil absolutely evil. Why are they using our tax dollars and burying us in debt for funding $200 million of projects to interfere in the foreign policy and the cultural norms of the rest of the world? Stop it. Stop it. This is unacceptable. This is why these bills are so disgusting. Um, Afrikaner farmers smack in the middle of rural KZN. That's true. There are Afrikaner farmers there. What's the point? I apparently missed something. Ronnie is become pride because it's early days. It was a very early attempt for a folk stunt. Mints their words. That's a true statement, LMC. You are correct. They became a prior, but they're being misreported on by people who are simply racist and unwilling to accept reality. Um, but you're correct about that. The Hawaii bound supersonic aircraft, folks, uh, you know, we lost the Concorde, but now a private firm called Boom anticipates a 2029 launch of a supersonic passenger airliner. Check it out. Boom Supersonic, which has its sights on commercial Hawaii flights, among others, starting in 2029, announced today the first successful flight of its XB-1. It's a milestone in the aviation company's plans for what is the first ever independently developed supersonic jet. The flight took place in the Mojave Air and Spaceport, and despite all doubts about the company and its plans, represents a big step forward. Look at that spacious, you know, the, the, the Concorde was tiny. Last year, Boom's SST XB1 received FAA experimental airworthiness certification following significant scrutiny. Wow. So its future planned supersonic airliner called Overture. The airliner's plan is a carbon fiber composite aircraft with state-of-the-art avionics, digitally optimized aerodynamics, and advanced supersonic propulsion. United Airlines, American Airlines, and others see the potential for supersonic travel via Overture, flying at Mach 1.7 and slashing travel time between Honolulu and California to a mere two hours. The forthcoming Overture SST with four engines and a streamlined fuselage is premised on increased efficiency and reduced noise levels. It will cater to discerning visitors seeking a faster and more luxurious travel experience. I never got to fly on the Concorde, so I look forward to that, folks. Yes, Donald Trump, $454 million judgment, and will Letitia James seek to confiscate his properties with her criminal actions against the Trumpster? State Attorneys General could pursue Trump's assets beginning today if he doesn't pay his uh, or pay or secure the bond by the end of the day. Yep, he's been trying to get a $450 million bond, which nobody's willing to pay because it's ludicrous. However, an appeals court says that Trump can post just $175 million. Breaking news here. Former president must post a bond $175 million within 10 days. So he just got a 10-day extension to come up with just under half. $175 million bond. With Donald Trump at the dock for a near, secure nearly a half billion dollar bond in a civil fraud case in New York appeals court appears to have handed the former president a lifeline, accepting a far smaller bond of $175 million. The ruling by a five-judge panel of appellate court judges is a crucial and unexpected victory for the former president, potentially staving off a looming financial disaster. Had the court denied his request and he failed to obtain a full bond, he was at risk of losing control of his bank accounts and some of his marquee properties. Well... The criminal actions of Letitia James coming to light once again. Barack Obama and Joe Biden are boasting about the Unaffordable Care Act, folks. The Unaffordable Care Act. Yep. Obama will appear with the uh, purported president, that would be Jackass Joe, and former President Clinton at a lavish event in New York. They're going to celebrate removing 20 million Americans from their health insurance to give free health insurance to 12 million criminal alien evaders and to people who pay nothing for it. We pay for their health care. 20 million working Americans, 20 million working Americans were deprived of the health care insurance by this Unaffordable Care Act. It was an abomination. It was a perversion of the insurance marketplace. It did nothing to improve health care. And they're going to celebrate it 14 years later. Shame on you. Massachusetts Governor Maura Healey blames Congress for the criminal alien invasion of America. Yeah, as CBS News calls it, the migrant crisis. 
Yep, Governor Maura Healey expressed frustration with Congress amid a migrant crisis that is impacting Massachusetts and other states around the country. This continues to be a huge frustration for me as governor. And we're having to clean up and deal with a federal government problem, she said. Well, it's just true. And she says, Congress should have fixed this by doing a deal on the border, fixing the border, reforming our immigration system. They have to act. And so states like Massachusetts are left holding the bag. No, absolutely wrong. There's no reason to reform our immigration laws. They work. If you enforce them, there's no reason for a border deal. That's a clandestine, surreptitious amnesty bill for criminal alien invaders who violate our sovereignty and are flooding our cities and towns and occupying our apartments and occupying our properties, driving up prices for Americans, illegitimately. People who are having a negative social economic impact on our country who have no business being here. Now, that is not an anti-immigrant statement. That is not a xenophobic statement. There are plenty of immigrants all around me and they came here legitimately. And we came here at a pace that we can absorb them and they can become part of society, but not this criminal alien invasion fostered by the corrupt jackass Joe administration. Nope, nope, nope. You are wrong, Maura Healy. The federal government is responsible for enforcing this and they're responsible for the mess we're in. However, the answer is not Congress creating more laws to be more generous, to let more people slide into this country when they have no business here. Nope, nope. You're wrong. This is another lie from the Democrats. Well... More money taken out of your pocket and mine if you're an American and given to corporate interest. That's right. I'm a person that loves business, but this is bogus. This bogus nonsense over this fantasy of rainbows and unicorns about climate and they're giving corporations more money so they can reduce their emissions. And of course, they'll continue to raise their prices for us. Energy Agency announced a $6 billion to slash emissions in industrial facilities. The Biden regime announced $6 billion in funding money for projects that will slash emissions from the industrial sector, the largest ever U.S. investment to decarbonize domestic industry to fight climate change. Excuse me, Washington Times. $6 billion of my money is not an investment for corporations. It's a subsidy. It's an illegal subsidy. That's what it is. And it's a waste of money. Wow. Energy Secretary General Granholm from Michigan, if I'm not mistaken, it said during a call with news media that, or she from Iowa, which, uh, that the technologies being funded are replicable, scalable, and will set a new gold standard for clean manufacturing in the United States and around the world. No, they won't. And we shouldn't be paying for corporations. They should be paying for that. They're already jacking prices up on us. Why are you taking our tax dollars and giving them these gifts? Now, I'm going to talk about fake news, folks. You ready for this? Fake news. Biden promising corporate tax increases has cut taxes overall. This is a lie and a misleading disinformation campaign by the New York Slimes. You ready for this, folks? Here we go. Here we go. President Biden has called for $5 trillion in new taxes on corporations and I earners, but his record so far is as a net tax cutter. That's a lie. That's a lie. Yep, Republicans say Mr. Biden is an unquenchable thirst for tax the American people. Hmm. So it might come as a surprise that in just over three years in office, Biden has cut taxes overall. That is a lie. That is an absolute lie. And let me tell you why it's a lie. Because they've given subsidies to people, their favorite classes, at the expense of those actually paying taxes. They didn't cut taxes. This is a lie. And what are these two programs? The math is straightforward, says New York Times. An analysis prepared by the New York Times by the Urban Brookings Tax Policy, an extreme leftist organization, a Washington think tank that studies fiscal issues shows that the tax cuts Mr. Biden has signed for individuals and corporations are larger than the tax increases he's imposed on big corporations. There are no tax cuts for individuals. We, I need a tax cut. I need a tax cut. Corporations didn't get a tax cut. Corporate tax rate remained the same. It was set by Trump and it's going to go up here soon. So let's talk about the two articles that they link to in the New York Times. The first one here is a child tax credit payment, a tax credit payment. In other words, a subsidy. If you're making payments, that's not a tax cut. He held the tax credit as one of the largest tax breaks for families in America. It's not a tax break. I didn't get a tax break. Nobody got a tax break except people who have kids in the house and it's not a tax break. It's a subsidy. People who don't have taxes paid are getting money. That's a subsidy, not a tax break. It's a lot. And his climate change garbage too. New Treasury Department data shows companies have 45,500 projects for possible sale on a new tax credit marketplace. Yeah, okay. So, mm -hmm. Treasury officials reported that more than 500 companies have registered for a total of 45,500 new clean energy projects with the Internal Revenue Service. That's not a tax break. That's a scam to give tax credits for people who spend money 
to achieve their ludicrous green fantasy ideals. Well, I said I'm going to talk about Reese, Angel Reese, the uh, obnoxious LSU player who rose to fame last year in the competition, wound up in the final against, of course, Caitlin Clark and LSU won. A very bad sport this woman is. Um, she is a uh, very, very very juvenile behavior, and someone really needs to talk to her and mentor her about her behavior. Now, I'm not getting excited. She did this when a player, bye-bye, when a player fouled out. Uh, but what I'm going to show you is that um, if this had been done the other way around and Angel Reese had fouled out and the player on Middle Tennessee State had done this, we'd be hearing about racism. You ready for this? Where's it at? Come on. Here we go. So come on, come on. Okay, here we go. Where's it at? That's not it. What's going on here? Oh, there it is. That's the one. Okay, sorry. So Angel Reese. This is Angel Reese from LSU, who's a very bad sport. Someone needs to talk to her. LSU star Angel Reese waves goodbye to Middle Tennessee player who fouled out. And they uh, eliminated Middle Tennessee State, but gave them a scare. The defending national champions nearly lost. There's Angel Reese. So here is the video in question. So let's, this is on Twitter. Here you go. So Angel Reese, watch what happens here as she fouls out late in the game. Put that on mute so that we don't get a copyright. Here we go. Okay, so there, Angel Reese gets knocked down by the player. Number two, let's go back and see that foul again. Okay, let's see who initiated the foul. Was it actually the player or was it Angel Reese? Oh, okay. Oh, did you see that? Angel Reese just takes a dive. Angel Reese takes a dive. She's barely touched on. Here it is right here. Watch her. She takes a dive and draws a foul. The other player didn't even touch her. Now watch what this bad sport does as she gets up because she got rid of her opponent. Watch this. Here it is. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Now there's the player. Oh, that's, I'm sorry. Is that a white girl? Is that a white girl that she did that? Now flip this script around. If the Middle Tennessee play State and Tennessee State player who's white had fallen down and won a, a, a penalty against a, a foul against Angel Reese, and then Angel Reese got up and she's like, "Bye bye." Um, we've been hearing racism, racism, racism. Yep. No. So I just thought I'd share that story. Look, I mean, I don't have a problem with Angel Reese being a bad sport. I mean, that's 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 on her. That's not on on uh, Middle Tennessee State. It's not on me. But I do have a problem with the um, hypocrisy about how it's covered. All right. Didn't go apparently average. Um, what's this? Full moon tonight? Yeah, it was pretty full last night. Um, the biggest economic problem with U.S. is their lack of support for small and medium-sized businesses. Yeah, there's a lot of truth in that, but we do spend millions of dollars for the Small Business Administration. And we um, have lots of federal laws that exclude many small businesses from participating to the advantage of others. So, for instance, the federal government gives preferential treatment to veterans, to blacks, um, and women in small business. And that's not fair. That's not fair. I'm a veteran. I don't think it's fair that veterans, women, and black businesses get preferential treatment competing in contracts. The best contractor should be the one that wins it. Um, this damages our society and harms small businesses to the advantage of picking winners and losers. Yep. Yep. That's the bottom line. I don't think that's right. Submersible. What's this? Uh, Debbie says, I'm private medical aid and still pay for white blood platelets. Would love to get country to pay for oh, Wow. Okay. Purchase a property. As far as I know, anyone can go live in Iran as long as your credit record is clear as prerequisite. Uh, well, you have to, Lorraine, you can only live in Iran if you prescribe to Dutch Calvinist Church, you speak off our cons, and you accept their rules. Yeah, but as far as skin color, that isn't an issue. Yep. What did I miss here? Never watch Death in Paradise. Oh, you missed out, scientist. Death in Paradise, great show. Anyway, really good show. All right, folks. Um, cheapest land, southern and areas, but often those areas still under chiefs. Here's the other thing. Um, thank you, see There's another thing. That people are like Orania. They went to the middle of nowhere in the Northern Cape on the edge of the Orange River to build a community. They bought the land, formed a private corporation. Nobody wanted the land. Of course, now they lie and say that they, they took land from the occupants. That was that was a lie, too. It's a fairy tale. Uh, they bought the land. They formed a corporation, and they set the standards. Ireland based. Um, no, Ireland is woke. That's what they got to say. Hey, John Jarvis here. Okay. Can't own there because it's a concession. KZN was an independent kingdom. 
but it was still part of South Africa. You can live there. The land just belongs to the Zulu kingdom. You're talking about the um, Inganyama Trust. Um, yeah, it belongs to the Zulu king. He can kick anybody he wants off of it. There's no land tenure. So it's a fair point. Uh, excuse me, I take a call here. So, yeah, anyway, um, yeah, it's, uh, sorry, I just, it's, people bother me, it's, it's not important. Anyway, yeah. Unfettered and understood capitalism works for everyone. Yeah, it does. Well, no, not understood. There, there needs to be a level playing field. You have to make sure people don't abuse the system. So that's what government's supposed to ensure a level playing field that everybody gets fair. Yay, more campaign calls. That wasn't a campaign call, Debbie. That was nonsense, a waste of my time. People have no business calling me. I thought it was something important. It wasn't. Yep, yep. In my opinion, the biggest economic problem with the U.S. Oh, I already read that. Okay, yeah. All right, folks, I've got to end it here. One thirty. Thank you for tuning in. Be sure to hit the like button. Appreciate you being here. We got 86 likes. I didn't quite get to 100. LNC is a great stream. I got to leave. I got to leave too. So, yeah, thank you all for being here. And I've got to get back to campaigning. Appreciate you being here. You all take care. Have a lovely day. God bless. And thanks for your support. Appreciate you being here. Um, let me turn that off and get back here and turn this on. And we'll see you here hopefully tomorrow. Cheers, everybody.